Our traveling days will soon be over here and we shall cross the rolling tide. For we're down here for just a little while, our home is on the other side. Ambassadors true for Jesus our Redeemer and it is a love crusade. For right against all butts and we'll join the throng in heaven when the saints parade. For heaven's king, for heaven's we will gladly sing the story, the story, story, the story. Old is old, yet is ever new. In glory we'll land of yonder, with that glad and happy band, we we'll call them the name in heaven in that parade. grand parade. So happy are we in telling you, my friend, that Jesus can redeem your soul. From every known sin and make you pure within. Joy billows o'er you then will, then will roll. A happy new song you will begin to sing to Jesus he the way hath made. To glory land fair you'll have a mansion there. And join us in the saints parade. For heaven's king, for heaven's we will gladly sing the story, 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 the All right, good morning. That is not the right slide. Let's try this again. That is not the right slide. There we go. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Coffee with Passion this morning. Sorry about that. And uh, I'm glad that you're here with us today. So there is no chat line today. So if you've tried to get on the chat line, um, there is no chat line today. That will be back on Thursday. But uh, we do have our broadcast today. I mentioned it's going to be a little bit of a special broadcast. Uh, I'm just going to give some kind of preliminary comments here. And then I've got a sermon, actually, that I'm going to share with you this morning that I hope will be a blessing to you. And uh, it was one that I enjoyed listening to a while back. And I'm going to share it with you here on the broadcast. So our broadcast today is going to be a little bit longer. And I understand if you're not able to stay on for the whole thing right here at this time it will be on youtube and you will be able to have access to it later if you need to finish uh, listening to it at a later time before we get started though i did just want to thank everybody uh, sunday of course was my birthday and y'all kind of pulled off the surprise birthday party there after church on sunday morning and i just want to let you all know i truly appreciated that and uh, we were leaving the church and uh, my wife was like, you know, we should go eat at Pizza Ranch. And I'm like, okay, fine, we can go eat. I don't know if Pizza Ranch is where I want to go eat, but we'll go eat. And she's like, well, I said, you know, what about just grabbing something quick and, and taking it home? And she's like, well, you know, it'd do you really good to be able to go to sit down and eat somewhere. Of course, I had no idea that uh, so many people were heading over there to, to do that. Um, so we're going along the way and, and I'm like, okay, she obviously wants to go to pizza ranch. Um, I almost actually pulled off to another restaurant. I was like, Hey, let's go here. But we didn't, we got to pizza ranch and I pulled up and I told my wife, I said, it is so busy. I said, look at this. I said, it's going to take us forever to get into this place and stuff. And she's like, Oh, come on. She said, I think it'll be fine. She said, we've been here before when it's busy. And, uh, so we're getting out of the van and we come around the corner and there is brother Miller holding the door. And I looked at my wife and I said, Oh, I said, you wanted to come here on purpose, didn't you? And, uh, because I saw Brother Miller and I thought, well, that's a coincidence. They're here. And then I saw um, someone else from the church. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on who it was. And I was like, oh, there's oh, there's lots of people here from the church. And then kind of came in the door and I saw the canes there and and uh, just several different people there that were there. And I was like, oh, OK, uh, this was all planned. And so I want to thank you all very much. I was surprised. And then my wife kept telling me, she's like, I was so afraid I was going to have to tell you, we have to go, we have to go over there because of the birthday surprise. Uh, she said, but she didn't have to tell me. And so she was uh, very happy with that. And I was very surprised. Thank you all very much. And I appreciate that. Hey, just a couple of announcements before we get to the um, sermon that I'm going to share with you all here this morning. 
don't forget that we have coming up May 31st, Memorial Day Picnic. That'll be at my house. I'm looking forward to uh, hosting that over at our house this year with my wife. And uh, we're going to be having the grill going and uh, hopefully also the smoker going. Hopefully it's not raining or we might be in trouble. But uh, I think we're going to have a good time. And that will be May 31st. We're going to kind of serve lunch right at noon on May 31st there. And so come on out and join us. And uh, also don't forget the anniversary revival coming up June 4th through the 6th. And we'll have Pastor Steve Johnson here with us. He'll be preaching Saturday night, or excuse me, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. He'll also be teaching the Sunday school hour on Sunday morning. So come on out and join us for those if you would. Then on Sunday, June the 6th, we're going to have our anniversary Sunday. We have got big things planned for Sunday. I'm hoping that, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully you'll come out and join us for that as well. As we are going to, after the service on Sunday morning, have pizza, family pictures, which we've often done before on Anniversary Sunday. We're going to try something a little bit different this year, though. We're going to take it outside, and we're going to try to do our pictures and everything outside. We're going to have a little photo spot set up in the back parking lot, as well as pizza back there. And we're going to set up some games, and we're just going to have a good time here at the church. So come on out and join us to celebrate the 19th anniversary of our church on June the 6th. That is on that Sunday. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to start the uh, message here this morning. I truly hope that it will be a blessing to you. After the sermon, the broadcast will just close, so I will not be back. We'll be back again, of course, on Thursday. Don't forget Wednesday night Bible study tomorrow night. We're going to continue talking about the revival of the heart. Looking forward to that. Hey, hopefully the message is a blessing for you this morning. God bless and have a great day. Jesus said in John chapter 12, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's what Jesus said. That's what we're trying to do here at Emmanuel. Hello, my name's Pastor Bob Gray, and I'm glad that you've taken the time to join us for one of our services. Our goal here at Emmanuel is to lift up Christ, to lift him up so high that no matter where you're at right now, he will draw you closer to him. That's our goal. May you enjoy the services of Emmanuel. And if I can be of service to you, please let me know. God bless you. Enjoy the service. How many want God to do something in your hearts? How many just want God to do something? You only have one shot at living for the Lord. And uh, I've thought often about how to decorate these hallways. Walked up and down these hallways, and I thought, what is the best thing you could ever do in these hallways? When I heard the chorale sing that two weeks ago in College Chapel, what better way to decorate a church than with the triumphs of God. How wonderful would it be to see the walls of Jericho coming down, be able to stop and show your kids, our God did that. The Red Sea parted. To stop your children and say, let's say, our God did that. A fish's mouth with coins hanging out. Our God did that. Because, see, we forget that he has reigned on high before you and I were ever born. And he has walked through human history with his footprint saying, I am God. And I think when every believer comes to the fact he is God, then we become like Isaiah. We make a transition. Isaiah chapter 1 through chapter 4, I believe it is. He was always saying, woe is you, and woe is you, and woe is you, and woe is you. But when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, you know what he said? Woe is me. I want God to do something. There's one word found in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. <laughs> Excuse me, Acts chapter 2 and verse number 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Please do not let the familiarity of the verse bring contempt in your heart for the message. Verse 2. And would you, would you say that next word with me? And what, please? Suddenly. Without warning. Without a precursor. Suddenly. 
Suddenly is an amazing word, and it's an amazing word because it's used different times throughout the Bible. This word suddenly means you have no idea at what point it's going to happen, under what circumstances it's going to happen. But listen, it will happen. When people live their life with suddenly, would you go to Luke chapter 2 and verse 13? And in Luke chapter 2 and verse 13, I'm going to pull out three portions. I was reminded of this just a little bit ago. Luke chapter 2, verse number 8, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto, unto them, Luke 2.10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. He shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Keep your eyes right there. Lying in a manger. And what please? Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Suddenly, all of a sudden, what was not there was there. But it happened so quick. Suddenly. Would you please travel to Acts chapter 9 and verse number 3. In Acts chapter 9 and verse number 3. Let's start with verse 1, Acts 9, 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and what please? Suddenly. No warning. No precursor. What was not there in an instant was there. What was not there with the angel after he spoke about Jesus, all of a sudden, suddenly, this great host broke into singing. Can you imagine the shock of all of a sudden something that wasn't there is there suddenly? Paul, Saul's on his way to Damascus, and then suddenly a light, he's knocked off. Go to, go to Acts chapter 16, verse 26. Verse number 20, let's back up. And brought them to, magist to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Verse 22, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. He made their feet fast in the stock. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard him, heard them. Look at verse 26. And what, please? Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Every revival that has ever taken place did not take place other than suddenly. It's suddenly that a dad is overcome and he needs to get right. It is suddenly that a mama can't stand it anymore, and now they've got to go to the altar. It is suddenly that a teenager on their way to Damascus, a teenager deep in the prison, a teenager hearing about Jesus, and then all of a sudden it is suddenly something happens in their life. It's suddenly that makes people get up out of their seat and do something. You see, you and I are just traveling through life, not even realizing that there's a God in heaven who's getting ready to suddenly do something in our lives. This is why he is God and I am Bob. Because suddenly, I'm not smart enough to know when to do this. I can manipulate people. 
I can try to get into people's minds. It, Hitler did it. Mussolini did it. Stalin did it. Jim Jones did it. But they did it through a series of mind control over time with the right words at the right vulnerable time. And this is how they led the masses to destruction. But when God does a permanent work in somebody's life, when God brings revival, he does not sneak up on you. He does it suddenly. I mean, you got on your horse, a man taking people to jail, and you're knocked off your horse as a man that says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Suddenly. And the thing that I am amazed at preaching is preaching the word of God is one of those kind of times that people come in a Saul. People come in in prison. But you let somebody give glad tidings of Jesus Christ and suddenly something's going to happen. You let somebody start singing at the midnight hour and suddenly something's going to happen. You let somebody be going against God like Saul and get ready, something suddenly is going to happen. So it doesn't matter if you are singing about Jesus, it'll suddenly happen to you. It doesn't matter if you're backslid on God and you are just away from God and you're part of the problem. Listen to me. God's big enough that suddenly it can happen to you. And it doesn't matter if you are in the middle of a prison and you just don't think there's any way out and you are in so deep like Paul and Silas and the only thing you can do is sing because you think you're stuck. I am telling you we deal with a God that suddenly will come down and do something amazing. Go back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Make your way back there, Acts chapter 2. Brother Poncho, I am going to need another bottle of water. Acts chapter 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I do not want to use antics tonight to get us revved up for revival. I just want to bring you Scripture and tell you this. Our God works suddenly when he goes to make an impact. Suddenly. What happened here on the day of Pentecost was a special day that turned into a powerful day. It was an event day that turned into an amazing day. This, this is sort of like what we're trying to do with Homecoming Revival. This is what churches do all over the place. They, they set aside their, their, their 50 days, that Pentecost. They, they set aside this day. And this day where everybody comes from everywhere in this day. And then all of a sudden, on this event, what went from a special day turned into a powerful day. And ladies and gentlemen, if you'll look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 2, look at what started happening. Happening, The atmosphere was electrifying. You see, when God suddenly moves into somebody and God suddenly does a work in a church or a family, let me tell you something, the family becomes electrifying. How many times have I heard somebody say, and I know that Emmanuel Baptist is right where we need to be. When somebody tells me, I walk through those front doors and something starts to happen inside of my spirit. This morning, this dear lady was sitting on the front row. And about halfway through, she started crying. We got all the way down the invitation. She is crying harder. Why? 
I'm going to tell you why. Because when God does something suddenly at some point, there is a continuation of an electrifying charge that happens in somebody's life, and it just keeps going. In the book of Acts, as they got to something suddenly happened, ladies and gentlemen, it propelled the New Testament church all the way to Acts 15, and this was amazing. Why? Because God did something suddenly. I think sustainable Christianity is impossible unless God does something suddenly in your life. I know the suddenly. I was 17 years of age sitting in the back of a triple S camp underneath that tabernacle, sitting next to my mom and dad, John Smith on the other side, and Glenn Riggs got up and preached on cheese. I have no idea what the sermon was about, but I do remember at that invitation time when I bowed my head that suddenly God did something in my heart to the point I couldn't sit there. I had to go out into the woods and get on my knees and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I can tell you this, I don't want to be the same. And I can tell you standing here at 53 years of age, whatever that suddenly was back there, it has made my life electrifying. And I'm telling you, when a church experiences this suddenly, it'll never be the same. When it's suddenly this happens, look at Acts 2.16. But this is that which was spoken of, what was spoken by the prophet Joel. When God does something suddenly, the continuation is electrifying. The continuation is all about the Word of God. All of a sudden, you're... Your proof point for conversation is not your experience. When God does something suddenly in your life, and if it's never happened in your life, if it's never happened in your life, and you've been going to church like I was raised as a rug rat in church, and it never happened in your life, it never happened in your life, then your only proof point of conversation is what your friend told you and what your daddy told you and what your mama told you. But when the Lord does something suddenly in your life, then your whole proof point is the Word of God. When God does something suddenly in your life, look at Acts 2.22. This is the continuation of this suddenly. When God does something suddenly in your life, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Let me tell you something. When God does something suddenly, then all of a sudden it's electrifying. Things start happening around you. When God does something suddenly in your life, and it's never happened, that's why the Word of God is not a, pre a preeminence in your life. And when it happens suddenly, and I can't explain it, then all of a sudden everything about Jesus, everything about Jesus, look what it says there. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, what please, approved of God. God does something suddenly. You can't listen to music about Jesus. You can't listen to a sermon about Jesus. Stephen Bentley, was it you that sent me that clip? Is it you or Mike? Was it Michael? Is it, where are you at, Mike? Mike sent me a clip of, of preaching. And that preacher got talking about Jesus. I don't think I know who the clip is, but he got talking about Jesus. And let me tell you something. You know what my mind ran back to? Back when I was 17 years of age. Let me tell you something. When God does it suddenly, are you tired of a miracle, a, a, a miracle round revival? Are you tired, teenager, of waiting to the next camp? Are you tired of getting past the next teen convention? When is the suddenly going to happen in your life that it becomes a permanent fixture? Your life is electrifying, and it's all about the Word of God, and it's all about Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Do you know when something's done suddenly, what you're going to find out is people are going to get saved. And people are going to get baptized. Let's not discount, my friend. Let's not discount the people who recently have gotten saved. Listen to this. 
The Bible says, let every man examine his own salvation, whether he be in the faith. And when this suddenly happens, then a person's got to come to grips, who am I in relation to the shed blood of Jesus Christ? And if I have never accepted Jesus as my Savior, then that verse, depart from me, I have never known you, does apply. And I think that when it happens suddenly, that you've got to step back, and all of a sudden you have to take introspection. But I will tell you this, when it suddenly happened to me at 17, I didn't have to go back and get saved. I had to go back and get right. And all of a sudden there was this, this suddenly happened. Some of you probably are sitting here right now and going, that's what scares me because I'm not in control. You're not in control. You belong to the maker. You're not your own. You see, we think that when we get saved, that the scripture that says you're not your own, you're bought with a price, does not apply to me, to me if I don't want it to apply to me. Oh, you are his. Lock, stock, and barrel, you are his. He gives you the breath to breathe. He blesses you to act like an idiot. He gives you the strength to go live in pleasure for self. But when it happens suddenly, there's always conversions. When it happens suddenly, there's always baptisms. Look at Acts 2.41. Then they that were, verse two, Acts 2, 41, then they that gladly, what please, were what? You see, when it happens suddenly, there's no begging people to do the next right thing. Amen. You see, when a pastor has to stand up and beg, when a pastor's got to drag, when it's like going to battle every time he gets up to preach, then something's not happened suddenly. Because when something happens suddenly, it's just simply this, reporting for duty. What is the next thing you need me to do? If you're looking for a qualifier, if that day God spoke to your heart, if it was the real deal, I can tell you this. If it was the real deal, your life is electrifying. If it was the real deal, then there's a preeminence on the Word of God. If it was the real deal, then Jesus Christ is all you want to hear about. Conviction and repentance, it happens. And this gladness about receiving God's Word, then what do you want me to do next? And then if suddenly happens, this is the continuation. It's not the sermon, but it is the continuation. Acts 2.42, look at it. The last thing I'll mention out of five more that I have, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayer and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions in good and parted them to all men as every man had need. When something's done suddenly in your life by the Holy Ghost of God, then you want to hang around other people that it happened to them suddenly. The camaraderie, that, that connect, that, that it factor. When God does it suddenly, then you're looking for other people that God did it suddenly. And then everybody has this communal living spiritually that says, how about if we pool our suddenlies and let's get together and let's go help people? How did they get there? What was it that was in place that God reached down and did something suddenly? <laughs> If you're sitting here right now, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to answer in your spirit. If you're sitting here and nothing like that has ever happened to you, you've always been a good little boy, good little girl. You've always been in and out of trouble. You've always been up and you've been down, the norms of being raised in a church. But there's never been that suddenly that there's never been when the heavens opened up and the angels started singing. There has never been that road to do your own thing and all of a sudden you were knocked off your horse and you could not do your own thing. There never was that time when maybe you were in the depths of despair in the prison like Paul and Silas and then all of a sudden, suddenly the earthquake happened. When did God rock your world and it changed you? Where were you at? 
What was going on? And if a believer says, that's never happened to me. I've always just done the next expected thing. I'm a preacher's kid. It is easy for preacher's kids to live off the coattails of their mom and their dad. But when did it happen to you? When did you know? Suddenly. How do you get there? Look at Acts chapter 1, if you will. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles to whom he had chosen. Please notice the wording. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them. How many days, please? Forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, the day of Pentecost means 50. He spent 40 days as a risen Savior giving them infallible proofs. It's me. Hey, it's me. He says here that infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You see, this kingdom of God that was to come, he spent 40 days as the risen Savior saying, it's me, it's me. Let me tell you about a kingdom that's going to come. And, and let me take away all doubts in your mind that I am he, infallible proofs. Let me, let me prove to you. He spent 40 days. And then verse number four, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But what is the next word? Wait. For the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Would you go to John chapter 16? When did they hear this of him? Look at John 16. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Go all the way down to verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Is it expedient for you that I go away? For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, look at this phrase, I will what please? Send him. You know what he said? I've got to go away, but I'm going to send him. Now go back to Acts chapter 1 and keep it in its context. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but what please? Wait for the promise of of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. That promise was the Holy Ghost of God. And you know what he told them? Wait. Because coming your way is a power that will so change you that you will never be the same. Wait. He said, now you've heard me talk to you about I'm the real deal. You have heard me tell you these are the proofs that I'm it. Now I am telling you that I want you to, re I want you to wait for 10 days. 10 days. They waited. 10 days. 10 days they waited. Ten days they isolated. Ten days they isolated themselves to an upper room. And they 
just waited. They waited with no outside festivities going on. They simply waited. And ladies and gentlemen, as they waited, look at verse 5. For John truly baptized with what, please? Water. But ye shall be baptized with the, what? Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again, thy, again the kingdom to Israel? Listen to this. Their perception. They did not have the perception to understand the timing and the season. Look what he said. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath, hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive what, please? After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Did you see that? He said, you wait for the promise. He said back in John 16, I'm going to send him to you. But here in Acts chapter 1, after 40 days, he said, me proving to you that I am who I said I am, and me showing you the proofs, and me talking about the kingdom, cannot be energized until the Holy Ghost suddenly does something in your life. Most people are content with having proved that Jesus is. How many sermons have been preached about Jesus being, and we all say amen? Jesus doing, and we all say amen. Jesus coming, and we all say amen. But ladies and gentlemen, we have not isolated ourselves and waited for the Holy Ghost to do something. And when he had spoken these things in verse 9, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you to heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Look at verse 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into the upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. And the number of the names together were about 120 men and brethren. This scripture must needs be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost gave by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was the guide to them that took Jesus. For he's numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that as a field is called in their proper tongue, Alcadamia, that is to say, the field of blood, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, and his bishop prick let another take. Wherefore, of these men, which have companioned with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? And they appointed two, Joseph called uh, Bar Barsabbas, whose name was Just, who, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the heart of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place 
and what? Suddenly. I don't know about you, but I've always been looking for that night in July of 84 when God turned my life upside down. And I think the problem with Christianity is this. We know all the proofs to say Jesus is the Son of God. We know all about His kingdom that is to come, and we can tell you all about the, the, the end time charts and the revelations and the seals. We tell all of that. But why is there no power? Why has nothing in your life and lives of people that you can point back and say, that night, God shook the earth. That night, he knocked me off my horse. That night, I heard the songs of God. And I'll tell you why. Because the formula here is simply this. Get out of the highway of life. Get to an upper room. Isolate yourself from any other voice. Go to prayer. And wait. We live in such an instant society. Instant society. That, that we want it done like, like today. Okay, okay, I was a good little boy for the last five minutes. Rock my world. No, no, I've gone 24 hours and, and I've kind of shut off the world. Okay, God. Earthquake. You know what God says? Go wait. With no expected end, just wait. There's something amazing about camp. There's something amazing about teen convention. There is something amazing about a retreat because you unplug and you get away and you are hearing about Jesus, but you are isolated with people who love Jesus and get ready. Something suddenly is going to happen. Are you willing to take 10 days and go to an upper room? You say, Pastor, I... I live a busy life. I have a schedule. I have a job. There's no way I could take 10 days off. I don't think that's the spiritual application. But outside of making a living for your family, how much do you indulge in the mainstream of this world? How much do you indulge? Can anybody tell me what 10 days starting tomorrow, what the date is, 10 days. It is April the 28th. I think I'm right on the calendar. Could somebody pull out your phone that you're not supposed to have out and kind of tell me that? Is that right? Is that right? Let me tell you something. God is waiting to do something suddenly. Are we willing to take 10 days and isolate? I tell you, technology has not helped us as much as it has hurt us. A phone's no longer a phone. A radio's no longer just AM, FM at the mercy of your antenna. There was a day, listen to this, there was a day when parents solved the rock music problem with the AM FM station in a car of a teenager by stealing their antenna. You would know which ones had problems with rock music that had no antenna on their car. Because daddy would go out there and unscrew it or daddy would go out there and bend it in half and they had to be in that car with no world. It was just them and God. Please, when you and I understand that God wants to do something suddenly, Acts 2, and I'm done, verse 14, musicians, if you'll come. 
But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, Judea, Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be, it, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. There is a baptism of the Holy Ghost that needs to happen in each of our worlds. And when he baptizes you, then all of a sudden, this perception about the things of God pick up. He said, like John baptized, when Nick came out of the water, he came out of the water the same man, but he was wet all over. And when the Holy Ghost does something in your life, you won't lose your personality. You won't lose your individualism. You won't become a clone in a white robe that you are a zombie. No, 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 no. No. God will reach down inside of you of how he made you, and he will pull out this glory that rests on the inside of you. You won't lose your personality. Peter didn't lose his personality. Peter, though, God sent the Holy Ghost to baptize him. You are secure because you're saved. This was the promise he gave us. But when is that Holy Ghost did something so permanent in your world that you've never been the same? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask you a very important question. Has something suddenly ever happened to you? Brother Hicks has been pouring his heart out for five minutes. And... But has something suddenly ever happened? He said, could, could it happen to me? Oh, it can happen to you. It can happen to you. But why don't you give God a chance to change you? Are you tired? Are you tired of this nominal Christian life? From Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 15, the church was phenomenal. Peter's being released from prison. God's coming down doing big things. I'm going to tell you why. Because anytime the Holy Ghost does something suddenly, it changes the world around you. This is what revival is. Revival is not meant to stay inside this, these walls. Revival is meant to change you so much that God does a sudden work in your life. Teenagers, He wants to do something sudden in your life. Moms and dads, Mama, you feel like you're all alone in that family? Isolate yourself with the word of God and in prayer and beg God to do something. Beg God to do something. And when the Holy Ghost got involved, people started getting saved. It was electrifying.